Welcome to the ACS Technical Advisory Board podcast series, where we talk all things tech including data, cyber, AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things. Meet your host, Dr. David Cook, Vice President of the Australian Computer Society's Technical Boards. David is a technology advocate dedicated to advances and progression of computing and human-computer interaction. In today's episode, David will be talking with David Norris. David is a cybersecurity expert who provides practical advice to small and medium businesses. David also sits on the ACS Cybersecurity Committee. Join us as we discuss the challenges of cyber in SMEs, the Essential 8 model and its integration into everyday business, and the impacts of not being cyber prepared in modern society. David Norris is a cybersecurity expert. He sits on the ACS Cybersecurity Advisory Committee. He walks the walk. He doesn't just talk the talk in terms of cybersecurity. And you can actually read his column in the uh, Western Sydney Publishing Group newspapers, various different versions, and you'll find that he gives practical advice to small and medium businesses. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David. It's good to be here. Um, You specialise in small to medium businesses in terms of cybersecurity advice. What are the big challenges in that sector? There are a number of challenges in that sector. I think the the biggest one is the lack of education and the most businesses feel that cybersecurity isn't an issue for them, that it's never going to happen to me. Now, I think it's been proven with all the breaches and breaks and everything else that's been happening recently that it should be a concern for for small and medium businesses. Um, I don't believe the government is pushing enough down onto small and medium businesses to educate them about the risks. Uh, I'm very passionate about educating small and medium businesses about these risks. But yeah, the biggest risk is is lack of education and more the, it's never going to happen to me. I know you're a passionate advocate for using the Essential 8 model um, and uh, you've had plenty to do with that yourself. Is it, is it really the kind of thing which resonates with small business? I mean, is it, uh, firstly, is it worth doing? And secondly, how do we make it more available for small and medium business people to take on board? The, the Essential Eight is a, is a good strategy developed by the government to address small business and medium business issues. Uh, I think it's a fantastic model for that size business. Um, Again, education is the piece. You can We go out to our clients and talk about the Essential 8. And while most have now heard of it, a lot, again, it, it's not something they feel they need to do. Um, when we go out to our clients now, without them actually realising it, we're implementing pillars of the Essential 8 as security within their organisations. Um, we get them to a level where it would probably take them just a little bit more funding to actually get them up to essential eight level one um the pillars of the essential eight really ensure that a small and medium business for a reasonable price point ramp up their security to a degree which would probably make them less attractive to a hacker um but really again it's an education piece i think at some stage the government probably needs to mandate that companies achieve a level of essential eight Uh, I don't think it'll be driven by the government. It's going to be driven by insurance companies. Um, Back three or four years ago, we'd get our clients coming up to us with insurance policies of one or two pages to fill in. Uh, Now that's gone out to eight, nine, 10, 12 pages to fill in. And the insurance companies are now literally asking their questions along the lines of the essential eight. So we're finding companies now who weren't interested in cybersecurity come to us with insurance policies and they then say, are we doing this? And we say, no, you're not. Uh, You need to take up these extra levels to do it and they'll get on board then. So I think the essential aid will get out there, but I think it'll be driven more by insurance companies rather than the government. Uh, And I think that's a good thing. Do you think in terms of the essential aid, do you think it's a sort of a a cost or a time effort issue? Is it that small businesses are still thinking, it'll never happen to me, I won't be affected? Or is it something where it's just a cost of business now and people are trying to take that into account? It's a little bit of both. Um, We have a model where we have a cybersecurity stack for 2023 and then a subgrade for 2024 and 2025. Uh, there's incremental increases in that as new and better tools come out and we, we bundle them into the packages. 
initially we had a lot of pushback by rolling these packages out to secure our clients and we literally had to go and meet with every one of them and explain the reasons why and for example one of the companies dealt with medical data and they really didn't want to pay the extra to get the cyber security and basically we said to them what's the value of your medical data if it gets out there onto the internet what damage is that going to do to your business and when you frame it in a cybersecurity is all about a risk perspective so if you address their issues according to the risk they will usually come on board because when they realize the risk is more than what the cost is going to be they'll, they'll come on board well, I guess I'm interested in whether people are just thinking that it'll never happen to them. I mean, and, and there are certainly a small percentage of people that do that. But the second part is really about whether it's something where they just will pay the money and kind of tick the box and move on, or whether people really are, you know, slightly becoming more interested in, in genuinely putting cybersecurity into their business. For the small and medium businesses, I think at this stage, it really is tick the box to meet the insurance requirements. I don't think they, out there in the small and medium business, it still very much is, I'm too small, it's never going to happen to me. Um, the typical breaches we see in this size aren't really targeted breaches, they're more the male phishing breaches and they get in that way. Um, but at the small and medium business, I don't think they may have a, be a scattergun type target, but they're not specific targets, so they don't specifically worry. And then they also think that the data I have if it gets out there, it's not going to be too damaging, so it doesn't really bother me. So it's a, it's a little a little bit of both. It's not going to happen to me, and it is the cost. We're going through tough economic times at the moment, and companies really don't want to spend more money than they have to. But again, if you frame it in a risk perspective, what's the risk? Most will come on board and, and at least pay an amount to get them to a high degree of safety. So... Let's cast our minds back to say uh, 20, 2021. We've got um, a large impact supply chain hack comes out of nowhere. What's the impact of that on business when something like that emerges out of nowhere and catches people out? Yes, that, that was a supply chain attack and that's probably one of the biggest risks to, to companies. Uh, they may have their own situation covered by a cybersecurity stack or, or have their process and procedures in place. But when a supply chain attack comes out, what they're targeting is they're targeting someone larger with access to smaller companies. So the one you're referring to targeted managed service providers or companies who look after other companies' IT infrastructure. Now, what happened with that one was they targeted MSPs because they can quite easily get access to hundreds of thousands of other customers by targeting a single customer. So... That supply chain attack, they targeted the main supplier of the software. That allowed them to get onto managed service provider networks, which then let them go out and target all the other small and medium businesses. That's At the time, that was a very, very hard thing to stop because it was, it was software which was secured by somebody else. Uh, as a result of that, there's a whole new bunch of tools that are out which will actually detect that sort of stuff and stop it immediately now. And those tools just weren't available back then. So I guess in a way that hack was responsible for bringing out a new raft of tools which will now look specifically for that sort of stuff. So let's think in terms of the future and where we're going with all of this. Obviously, putting aside third-party vendors and some of those challenges, what do you think is the emerging big ticket item what's the the really the biggest emerging threat for the sorts of people that you give advice to in small and medium business at the basic level it's still education um it's still the people there's a number of things that are going around the small and medium business which are, is really allowing them to be hacked the most common one now is is linkedin so basically companies or hackers will go look on linkedin see if someone's changed or moved into a new company they will then target that specific individual and it's usually along the lines of hey you're new to the company uh, i'm going to give all the staff apple itunes cards as bonuses and i know it sounds corny but we've had a number of clients hit by it and basically that that they'll say we don't want any of the staff to know so can you just go out and get them and we'll reimburse you 
Um, and basically, the people are young. They don't know any better. They'll go out and buy the Apple iTunes cards. They'll send them the links, and uh, then they'll go to their bosses and say, oh, can I be reimbursed? And that's when we get involved. So in part, it's education for small and medium business. They're still being tricked up by, by really, really silly things. They still get tricked up by phishing emails. Um, they get tricked up by the LinkedIn targets quite often. Um, so, yeah, it's really an, an education piece. Longer term, I think it's going to be probably AI tricking. AI tools are going to be problematic for small and medium businesses, uh, both from a hacking perspective and from an internal hacking type perspective. There is a case out there where a person had access to a company's AI tool interrogating the database, and he specifically asked for the mobile phone numbers of all women under a certain age. Uh, so AI tools are really going to start getting out there and they're going to give people insights into companies that they just don't know. AI tools are going to give small and medium businesses who use them insights into areas of the business they're not supposed to because they're not going to be able to know what the AI tool is locked down to and what it isn't. So... AI is going to be a real risk in the future. And if a hacker could get internally into the company and have access to the AI tool, that's going to be a lot worse. So they'll have access to nearly everything. But again, the ultimate risk for small and medium business, which is what I go to, is education and really being able to identify who's a hacker, uh, what's a phishing email, and really that's the basics. If they can cover the basics and have the right tools in place, I think there'll be a really good degree of protection, but we still do regular phishing for all of our clients and we would still get, you know, 5% of them all actually supply credentials on a regular basis and that is with training. So um, it's a bit of a long road, but I think if we put the tools and processes and procedures in place, put the training in place, I think it will really stop uh, hacking concerns around small and medium business. David, I really like the fact that you've um, reinforced the need for education. I mean, we're in the Australian Computer Society, so we live and breathe education. And uh, I mean, shameless plug here, of <clears> course, but the ACS has their accelerator program where people can jump on and learn any number of different ACS uh, accredited cyber security skills. So I encourage that. But I, I really appreciate the fact that some of the people that we've got, such as yourself, are working hard towards not just working at the highest level, but everywhere in between. Because even if you are a CEO of a Fortune 500, um, you'll still have people working underneath you and people who'll be doing things. And it's those people who won't really have the same understanding of cyber hygiene. And I guess to some extent, the work that you do in small and medium business is really important because that's where it's easy. That's where the, uh, the low hanging fruit is. It's very easy to convince people who are probably more focused on doing what they really are doing, selling ice creams or, or uh, you know, fixing taps or whatever their business is, as opposed to worrying about cybersecurity. So, David, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, David. It's been great. To find out more about how the ACS is powering Australia's technology brilliance, visit us at our website, Facebook or LinkedIn. Want to get involved with the ACS technical boards? Email us at tab at acs.org.au and tell us a bit about yourself. Join us for more thought leadership, ideas and information through our other podcasts on the ACS YouTube, Facebook or on LinkedIn.